So now it's time for us to move on to the detailed pass, and that involves particles as well as instance geometry. Now, one thing to keep in mind here is that when you're fracturing big simulations like this, you'll reach a point where your poly count is really high, and any more fracturing at this point is going to cause your renders to slow down and your project to be pretty unapproachable. Now, I would say that this is just about as much geometry as you want to have uh, for your average scene. You obviously could go further on the fracturing and the, the number of pieces if you want, but there is a huge, huge advantage to utilizing packed geometry, especially for the smaller pieces. And with that packed geometry, you won't be killing your render times. It'll look super detailed and you'll be able to push this way further than if you just use regular polygons. So in other words, in your destruction workflows, the particles and the instance geometry is arguably one of the most important layers to any simulation, because that accounts for most of the detail that you ought to see. For this particular situation, I think it makes a lot of sense to focus on these in-between areas again. So, you know, let's say that we have a, a volume that we make along these areas, and we fill that volume with particles. Now, these particles are going to be instanced geometry. So in other words, we take maybe five, 10 of these pieces, we put it on the particles, right? And we're going to have our own simulation where we take these particles and we fling them up in the air. That's going to be one of the, the passes that we do. So for this particular pass, we're essentially adding to that in-between simulation but we're adding a lot of smaller detailed pieces instead of the larger, chunkier ones like right here. The way this works is we're going to take a piece, let's say this guy right here, we're going to activate it on a certain frame. So we'll find a way to activate this. We won't activate them all at the same time. We'll find an interesting way to randomly activate this over time. But we activate them, velocity, it pushes these pieces up in the air. And as they fly up in the air, they're going to go in random directions, which exist, let's say, within a 30 degree angle. So in other words, we're going to have velocity, and these velocity vectors will be within, let's say, a 30 or 45, whatever, degree cone. So each piece will have a random velocity vector, some of them over here, some of them straight up. You get the idea. Now, that's going to be one portion of the velocity that we work on. If we just stick with that, though, it's not going to be enough for us to have an interesting looking result. So in addition to that cone velocity, right, that random cone velocity vector, let's also find a way for this piece to generally follow the other pieces that happened in the in-between sim that we just got done with. So in other words, I want them to follow the general motion of what these guys are doing too. And the way that we can do this is we can take, let's say a frame that we freeze everything on. So let's say that I take frame 30, which is maybe this screenshot that we're looking at right here. We freeze everything. And then we basically just take the positions of these pieces that are up in the air and we can turn their positions into velocity vectors for the packed primitives. So in other words, let's say this is our packed primitive right here. Let's say that there is a piece up here that got frozen on frame 30. We want to look for the nearest piece. So we're going to use a near points function, right? To first of all, identify the piece to look at. We'll then go up here using the point function, we're going to pick up this piece's position. And then with that information, we can draw out a velocity vector, which points in the direction of that piece. And if you remember what a velocity vector is, it's basically just a location relative to a point. So if my velocity vector is, let's say, one in the y direction, it's going to be relative to the point, and our velocity is 0, 1, 0. And again, that would be an example of a y velocity. 
if we take, let's say, this position right here, and we figure out the difference between that and our current position, so let's say that minus this position, then that will equal the velocity vector that we want to draw out, which will point the piece in the direction of that piece up here. And that's going to give us a velocity that generally follows the overall direction that this simulation was originally going in. So we're going to take these two velocity vectors and blend them together. That will equal the motion of these pieces. And then we're also going to have them collide against these plates. So, you know, imagine we have these plates right here. We can do the simulated version if, of this if you want. We might be able to get away with the non-simulated version. It just probably depends on, you know, whether or not pieces end up hanging out towards these edges or not. Uh, but long story short, we'll, we'll bring in the plates here. We'll let the instance geometry fall through the in-between areas. And um, if we need to have these pieces collide with the larger pieces of the in-between sim, we can also filter those out uh, using a measure sop, and we can add that to our collision meshes as well. But basically, we want to just take these particles, fling them up in the air. Uh, this is really the instance geometry and uh, have them collide with only the most important things. If it doesn't collide perfectly with everything, that's okay, because a lot of this is going to be motion blur, and it, you won't be able to tell the difference anyway. But we do want to account for the big pieces, even though uh, that adds more time to our sim. And yeah, that's pretty much the general idea here. So anyway, if you didn't catch all that, don't worry. I'll explain all this as I demonstrate here in the next video or so. And I'll see you there.